Right, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day everyone. So, welcome back to SID 3019. Um, today, we're going to continue for our lecture. Okay, so we'll continue where we left off first and then um, we'll touch into um, COVID-19 vaccines and then uh, we'll touch a little bit about um, the rapid test kit. Okay, so RTK. Alright, so let's move into it. Okay, so um, for the attendance for today, you don't need to do anything. If you just scan on this, there's actually a joke inside there. Um, but the idea is for all asynchronous lectures, you don't need to take any attendance. Okay, so you don't need to do anything. It's, it's just a joke. There's nothing. Alright, so um, all of our vaccination, part 2, related technologies, continuing uh, vaccines, part 2, and a rapid test kit. Let's go into it. Hopefully, I'll be able to finish it um, in the next 3, about 38 minutes or so. Okay, so part 1, vaccine. Um, as we recall, I actually have touched about this note. I'll just skip through it into this uh, section over here. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is what we've looked at um, last week where, um, as, as I mentioned, it's not covered in the lecture at all. Okay, so this is just an additional information for those who are interested in looking at how our body process um, antibodies or antigens to produce. Um, to the end, the outcome is either antibody or the natural uh, NK cells or natural killer cells um, options. Okay. All right. So today code today's code is no need to for attendance um, taking. Um, but please do watch this video from Spectrum because I will have um, an embedded questions um, throughout the lecture. So if you want to have a practice, then uh, by all means please watch using Spectrum and Spectrum only. Okay. So part two, relative technologies, vaccines, part two, and rapid test kit, um, vaccines continuing from last uh, lecture. So in the last lecture, um, we've uh, looked at a little bit on what is vaccine or what is the, the, um, the process of um, antibody development um, from either from a, a normal perspective whereby the phagocytes are engulfing or phagocytosing um, foreign objects or we've looked at how um, if say vaccine is being injected into into your body and then uh, how is the process going on and to the end of the day you are producing either uh, a natural um, neutralizing antibodies or opsonizing antibodies or um, you can also uh, create a cellular human response whereby you uh, your body will uh, produce or, and multiply Macrophages, NK cells, and uh, cytotoxic, cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CTL. Okay, but um, that's not the the main focus. The main focus is to focus on and look at, at um, the antibodies being produced by um, our body. All right. So um, as also mentioned, the parts for antibody production is three. Okay, the first one is um, the identification. Okay, um, or detection. And then the second one is uh, processing, and then the third one is presentation. Okay, so those those three things, or or similar words that involve these three things. If it's in the exam, then I will still accept it. Okay, because to the end of the day, that is the basic concept of um, antibody um, processing from um, the foreign object into uh, an antibody. Okay, so but the focus here is um, just antigen processing, and in the aspect of antigen processing, the minimum component of vaccine is um, needed. Okay, so um, instead of using a traditional way whereby you are using the whole organism, and this whole organism, there might be some components that your body do not need at all. So if you were to still use this full um, organism, there might be some adverse effect. Okay, uh, for example, if you want to look for um, information about group A streptococcus or GAS vaccine. If you um, try and search for uh, this keyword, you will see that um, there is currently no vaccine um, against group A streptococcus. It's a bacteria, um, it's like BCG but, or, or TB, but there's vaccines for TB. 
But um, for gas, group A strep streptococcus, there's actually no vaccine, even though research has been going on for more than 50 years. Okay, So um, reason being, the earlier processes whereby you are using the whole organism, the whole bacteria, um, the, the issue was that um, uh, your, your, your body is so overwhelmed with all the uh, foreign objects that one of the um, key antibodies that was produced during antigen processing is actually an antibody that binds to the heart. Okay, so um, it's actually causing a side effect. Um, in this, this is an example of a clear side effect of a vaccine. But again, thank God it's not a vaccine. It's, um, it's a candidate vaccine. So it was still under uh, research that people discover, oh, it's, it's actually not a, a proper vaccine. And thus, there's no market for, um, uh, for that particular vaccine. Okay. So moving back to the lecture. Um, so the minimum, uh, minimum component um, of a microorganism can also be used to develop a vaccine. In this case, what we are interested in is the antigen, a foreign entity. So instead of the whole organism, we might take some parts of it as the antigen or the, the foreign entity. We can also use adjuvant um, as the danger signal. Remember when I mentioned from last week, we, have, we need to have the foreign object and the danger, danger signal. So one of the ways, um, if you use a whole organism, so the danger signal is already there. But if you use a minimal component from that particular um, organism, the da danger signal might be lost. Therefore, the need to use um, a component that can boost the immunity uh, that we call as an adjuvant. Okay? So this adjuvant can be a booster. It will provide a danger. Uh, it's a booster for uh, as a booster for the sign, a danger sign for our body, um, and and. Some researcher might say it's a booster for the production of antibodies. Uh, but again, that's uh, not really um, uh, clear on, on that. It's, it's still a, a gray area whereby we don't really know um, whether um, each adjuvant is working in the same way. We know that, uh, we, we can know that a certain adjuvant, so for example, adjuvant A, is working uh, via toll-like receptor. Adjuvant B might work in a different pathway. So um, that's, that's why we just call it an adjuvant. Um, it has so many functions and we will look into it um, in the next few slides. All right, so, and also you can have more advanced technology uh, for the signaling of, of antigen or um, a delivery or carrier molecule that is maybe not an adjuvant, but it also helps in uh, inducing an immune response in your body. Okay, signal for antigen. Um, say, for example, if you use an organism, okay, um, COVID-19, for example, the spike for can be considered as an antigen. Um, but what Pfizer is using is not really the protein itself, but rather the signal that carries the information about the antigen. So this is when, this is where the uh, DNA vaccine or mRNA vaccine comes into play. Okay. So these are more advanced technologies. Um, I'm not going to touch about it in very detail. We'll just touch bit and pieces um, to just enhance your understanding of um, the vac the technologies in, in vaccination. Okay, um, that picture over there is just another way uh, to represent um, antigen processing. Okay, from um, cyto cytosolic proteins uh, processing was going to happen and then until the end representation in the major histocompatibility complex or MHC. All right, so now we will look at the terminologies one by one. The first one is an antigen. So what is an antigen? So an antigen, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, is a substance that is capable of stimulating an immune response. As simple as that. So anything that can um, uh, that can uh, induce uh, or stimulate an immune response, we call it as an antigen. So the terminology that I'm uh, normally use is a foreign object. Um, it's a yes and it's a no, because antigen is actually a, a general terminology. Okay, um, as mentioned in number key point number two. So there are two types of antigen. One is heteroantigen. Another one is autoantigen. 
So hetero antigen is the foreign antigen that I keep on saying uh, in the previous few slides, uh, previous few lectures about foreign objects, antigen, foreign objects and antigen. So it's a type that we call as hetero antigen, while auto antigen is a self um, antigen. Okay, meaning that you know that your body have your own antibodies. Uh, sorry, have your own proteins, right? And your proteins can be different compared to a different guy. So the function may be similar, but the sequence can be different. There are a lot of uh, post processes that is happening that makes uh, your antibody or your, your proteins in your body can be more unique to another person. Okay, uh, one good example is a different of blood type. So we have um, blood type A, B, and then O or A, o, A B, so a combination of A and B. So we have these four blood types. Um, but all of them are red in color. That's one thing. And all of them have proteins. So these A, B, um, A, B and O are um, different types of proteins. So they are different types of self-antigen. So your self-antigen, so my self-antigen might be different than your self-antigen. Okay? So that's why if, um, say, I have a blood uh, type of B, you have blood type of A, when I put my blood into your body, so your body will process it as a foreign object. Now it becomes a hetero antigen and it will produce antibody against, it, uh, against my blood. Okay? Um, you can talk about it in, in more detail in case if you are interested in you know, talking about different blood types. Uh, but otherwise, we'll just continue with the lecture. Okay? Uh, a self antigen is also um, for self identification. So you have your white blood cells going through around your body. You have your, your um, B cells, for example, that are producing um, um, your antibodies going around your body. Okay? So um, you need to have an indicator to tell the cell, uh, to, to tell the, the B cells or um, white blood cells in general that this protein is your body. So do not kill it. And that one is a foreign object. So go ahead and kill it. Okay? So something like that. So that's why you need to have this um, foreign and uh, self um, antigen. We call it antigen because the first person who discovered it names it as a self antigen. Okay? So um, people who have um, immunocompromised, people who are immunocompromised have uh, issues uh, in terms of detection of self antibodies. Okay? Self antigen, sorry on saying self antibody self antigen okay so disruption in the system um, the self identification system may cause or may lead to autoimmunity so people who are actually autoimmune they have this kind of issues whereby the white blood cells um, are not able to identify between um, a hetero antigen and a self antigen okay now this is a picture of antigen so an antigen is everything um, okay so uh, following all this lecture I, I want to make a, a clear statement following all these lectures when I'm talking about antigen I'll be focusing about foreign antigen um, at all I will not be talking about self antigen okay self antigen stops here that's about it all right so when we are talking about antigen so antigen itself um, can be a foreign object and that foreign objects can be uh, either a big foreign object or a small foreign object. A big foreign object, say for example, a whole bacteria or a whole uh, virus, um, while a small uh, antigen can be just um, a small part of the whole organism. Okay? If you're thinking about COVID-19, whereby the virus is a circular and then there's a lot of um, spikes, we call it a spikes protein. So if you have read um, newspapers, they might call it spike protein or they might call it as crown okay because it looks like a crown a king crown okay so um, this crown if you were to to take it out can be identified as an antigen however some parts of this um, antigen might not be uh, useful in inducing immune response okay uh, uh, specifically might not be useful in um, producing an antibody Imagine that this protein is very huge, okay, like this in the blue. And um, as, as you recall, um, proteins are globular in shape, right? So you have um, polypeptides or, or polypeptides uh, chain 
throughout the uh, globular protein. Now, the sequence inside, the, the peptide sequence inside the globular protein might not be as beneficial to produce an antibody compared to the, the outer layer. Okay, so why do I say that? Imagine, um, you need to uh, just talk, imagine um, your body have an antibody. Okay, so if you are producing an antibody against uh, the sequence within the protein itself, how can the antibody goes into um, the, the object, the foreign object and identify and signals um, through um, signals, the macrophage or APCs that this is a foreign object via the FC region. Remember the FC region, the, the stem of the, um, the antibody? Okay, so you need to use that particular section to actually uh, signal um, the white blood cells that th there is something here. So something is happening here, something is that. Okay, so um, for a, um, a production, a, a, a good production of antibody, uh, the antibodies that can bind to the surface of that particular antigen. Okay, and the section by which the antibody can bind to that um, whole protein is called as epitope. Okay, so meaning that uh, if the antibody is being produced against this, um, okay, sorry about the drawing, the drawing is wrong. Okay, so um, the drawing should be like that. Okay, and it's a double um, stem. Okay, so imagine if uh, this antibody, just for, for the sake of this lecture, we just call it as an IgG. So imagine that this IgG binds to this sphere, yeah, sphere, okay? It binds to this sphere. And of course, the same antibody will not bind to this other section, right? So this section is now called as an epitope, while the other section is just nothing. There's no name for it, okay? Um, uh, you, you can call it non-epitope or whatever, but um, there is no um, clear terminology for that part particular region. Similarly, for this triangle, um, if that antibody binds to that particular region, then that region we can, we, con we can consider it as an epitope as well. But everything else is considered as an antigen as a whole. Okay, so an epitope or antigenic determinant Okay, so a component that determines the, um, um, the object as an antigen. Okay, a region in an antigen that binds to receptor on white cells, for example, lymphocytes and dendritic cells, um, promote humoral or cellular responses. Okay, so if you want to recall um, on the concept of humoral and cellular, you can always go uh, three slides back um, um, from lecture number four. Okay, so slides on lecture number four, it's not here in lecture number five. Um, and you can see that um, this is it, okay? So um, the humoral and cellular response. So you need to have that particular epitope uh, for, for this to um, happen, okay? All right, so um, now we, we will move to the second um, component for a vaccine, which is an antigen. So according to Encyclopedia Britannica, an antigen is a substance that enhances the effect of a particular medical treatment. Okay, and it's a very general, um, it's for medical treatment, but uh, if you were to go to specific for um, immunology, then it becomes, uh, the definition changes to a substance that increases the body's reaction to an antigen. So it can be a booster, okay? that provides the danger signal. So if you just use an epitope, remember uh, from the previous slide like this, if you just take the sphere, now you know that this sphere can develop an antibody, okay? But if you just uh, take the sphere, which is a peptide, uh, a shorter version of a protein, a peptide, and then you synthesize it in the lab, and then you want to use it as a vaccine, it might not work, okay? Because of, again, as I mentioned, loss of danger signal. So, um, adjuvant is needed and adjuvant function to boost the body's response against that particular um, antigen, okay? So, adjuvant can be a synthetic, uh, synthetically produced or it can be bio-derived. So, what do I mean by this? Uh, synthetically, um, 
approve uh, a synthetic um, adjuvant is whereby the adjuvant can be synthesized in the lab. For example, this MP, uh, MPL can also be synthesized in the lab, even though um, MPL is normally uh, being extracted out from bacteria, but uh, I'm just saying that you can actually synthesize this. Because if you look at the structure, it's pretty much just uh, a sugar and a lipid. Okay, so you can definitely, and you can see the connection bit is very easy. That one is an ester, that one is an amide. Again, um, you have hydroxyl over here and there. You have an ester again, and you have a phosphorus uh, function group. And these are sugars. Okay, so definitely you can uh, synthesize MPL in the lab. But um, uh, for the sake of uh, this lecture, MPL um, that I mentioned here was extracted out from bacteria so that you can have uh, a large in a larger quantity very, very quickly. Okay. So uh, you can also look at uh, references uh, by which I mean by toll-like receptors, agonists. Okay. So anything that has a, a long lipid chain like this okay, is an agonist for a toll-like receptor. Uh, they are so... Um, so far, uh, I know that there's nine different toll-like receptors. It's a receptors that identify um, a certain components of foreign objects. Okay, for example, a lipid chain like this um, can be identified by toll-like receptor four. Okay, so if you were to use it as an adjuvant, it might work in the same way uh, because to the other day, um, the lipid chain can activate toll-like receptor thus providing the danger signal for that particular uh, antigen that you are carrying, that, that the component are carrying. Okay. Additionally, a bio-derived um, antigen, uh, sorry, bio-derived adjuvant is a diphtheria toxoid. Okay. What's the difference between toxoid and toxin? Toxin is a big molecule, toxoid is a small component of that particular uh, big toxin. Okay. So part of the dif diphtheria toxin, um, it's also shown in uh, an accession number of uh, 4OW6. So that's the picture of uh, diphtheria toxin. Okay. And that's the picture of MPL. So other examples include um, aluminum hydroxide. So it's not synthetic. It's not a biological drive. You can just, you know, gather it from, from an aluminum mine, for example. Okay. You do have an oil in water emulsion. So anything that um, is ionic, so ionic surfactant, for example, can also form um, an emulsion that can be used as an adjuvant for vaccine. And these three examples shown here are actually um, the adjuvant that is uh, approved for use in vaccines. Okay by the um, US FDA, Food and Drug Administration. So these are the organization in the United States that um, governs all the um, uses of drugs and foods and so on and so forth, okay? All right, and the third one is um, a ca delivery uh, or a carrier molecule, okay? So in a generic term, it's a multifunctional component that can serve as a carrier for storage Meaning that, um, say for example, you have uh, an, an antigen or a peptide antigen, okay? Um, if you just deliver it as a peptide, then it might be degraded very easily because it's a small molecule, okay? So you might want to put it in the carrier that does nothing, uh, but it keeps the antigen away from um, enzymes that can degrade proteins or peptides, okay? It can also serve as protection against degradation, as I just mentioned. Okay, it can be a booster, it can be a, uh, an antigen as well, so it can be a carrier and an antigen, and thereafter release the cargo, which is the, either the antigen, um, or it is the antigen, definitely, so either the epitope, uh, peptide epitopes, or uh, it can be a peptide, it can be carbohydrates, it can be mRNA, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is the delivery agent. Um, but then again, so even if we have talked about these three components, so the antigen, adjuvant, and carrier, is this is not the only components that is available in a vaccine. So all, all vaccine will have a mix of this, not, not every single component, but they can have a mix of this. For example, 
they will definitely need to have a preservative. Why? You need to preserve the vaccine so that um, but the proteins or peptides will not be degraded or the mRNAs that is inside the protein will not be degraded. You need to have a stabilizers, especially if you have an oil in, in, in water emulsion. So an emulsion is not something that is um, uniform. Okay? Um, imagine like if you are mixing uh, a cooking oil and water at home. Okay? So that is a two separate layer of oil and water. If you try and mix them, it will become a, a white, um, uh, like a white solution, and there is no uh, current. Uh, there won't be any clear distinguish layers between what is oil and what is water. So this is what we call is uh, this is what we call as oil in water emulsion. Okay, um, stabilizers. So um, you might have other proteins inside your particular vaccine. For example, albumin because some vaccines are produced inside an egg. So if you're allergic to eggs, then you know, they might cause some issues, not because of the vaccine itself, but the way the vaccine was produced. You might also have an inactivating agents, for example, formaldehyde. So those who, who are worried about all oh, chemicals here and there, okay? So formaldehyde may also be part of the component that produces the vaccine. And I will show you an example uh, after this, okay? There can also be an, an antibiotics inside there for sterility or probably antibiotics used during um, cell culture, uh, the growth of cell culture. It can also be MLC fires, okay, helps the component integrity and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of other components inside the vaccine and um, all of these have been researched before uh, being used in humans. Um, yes. So to say, even the COVID vaccine, um, they might be not be well researched, but nonetheless, they are being investigated before they can be used in humans, all right? So, and the final slide for vaccines is this, okay? So these are the three examples of COVID-19 vaccine that is, um, at least that, that I've known uh, Malaysia gonna um, import, okay? So we have number one on the far left, we have Pfizer vaccine. Uh, we have on the far right, we have the Sinovac vaccine from China. And we in the middle, we have the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Okay, so what are the differences? Let's have a look um, very quickly. So um, for the Pfizer vaccine, the terminology is encapsulated mRNA vaccine. So mRNA is the antigen. And when it says it's encapsulated, so it can be either a delivery or a gene that is used actually covers uh, the cargo or the mRNA. That's why the figure shown here is that's the mRNA in the middle and encapsulated with something. Okay, And that something, uh, I'm not sure if it mentioned uh, about it here. So it did not mention anything about it. Um, I, I can't really remember, I, I can't really recall the name of that particular component, but um, it's, it says there simply lipid nanoparticle. Again, lipid nanoparticle, if you go back to this particular slide, um, MPL is a lipid. Okay, So um, this particular vaccine might not be just a carrier, so the encapsulator might not be just a carrier, but it might also be an adjuvant where it activates uh, certain parts of immune um, identification. Okay, so that's the first one. So mRNA coding um, for the spike protein. Again, it's not um, uh, an antigen per se, but, but rather a signal for an antigen, the spike protein. In the repeat, uh, a soap bubble, and once absorbed, the cell expressed in the spike protein, resulting in immune response. Okay, so um, what it does is um, the vaccine um, delivers information for the cells, for our cells to actually produce the spike protein. And then the spike protein will be expressed outside of a cell. And remember, because this um, spike protein is not a self antigen, it's a hetero antigen. Therefore, our body will um, identify it as okay, this is a bad thing, we need to do something. Thus, um, the antigen is being processed and um, therefore producing an antibody for our protection. Okay, 
Um, AstraZeneca, on the other hand, is using a dsRNA, again, a signal for uh, an antigen, encoded for the spike protein, which is, um, so to say, almost similar to Pfizer, protected in a safe virus. So now they are using virus as the carrier, a delivery agent. Okay, why do you want to use a virus? Um, if you look at this, the name is adenovirus. So adenovirus, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's just a flu virus. It's like a flu virus. So it's not that dangerous um, to our body, but nonetheless, it carries the danger signal. Okay, so once it's carried the danger signal, you can uh, activate the immune system. At the same time, the dsRNA inside here can produce, um, well, th there is a path. No, it's not directly producing the spike protein as per mRNA. So the dsRNA will be converted to mRNA first before it's being, um, uh, before the spike protein can be expressed. So again, spike protein being expressed, a heteroantigen, a white blood cells uh, will identify it and process it and produce um, Hopefully, uh, the adverse for protection. Okay, and finally, uh, for Sinovac, they are using an inactivated virus. So they are actually using a whole virus. So this is much like the traditional way, you know, way of vaccine. Okay. So uh, because again, traditional way is using a whole organism. Right, so Sinovac is using a whole organism, um, and of course, they, it, it's already being inactivated, meaning that it will not replicate itself, it will not produce any um, um, side effects in, in terms of um, you being injected, and then your body is actually producing COVID-19 virus, and then you can infect someone else. It doesn't work that way. So it's an inactivated virus, meaning that the virus is no longer uh, alive or viable, so it's still a virus nonetheless, um, uh, and they are using a chemical called uh, beta propionolactone. Okay, so it cannot replicate, but all the proteins remain intact. So these are the three uh, vaccines that that are currently being used, uh, and I hope that um, the past past few lectures can actually help you to understand and value um, vaccines that being developed. Okay? It's not an easy path, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's, it's beneficial, hopefully, for everybody. Okay, so let's move on to the second section of this lecture, which is the rapid test kit. So the uh, rapid test kit, the um, lecture is not that long. Okay? Um, why? Because um, the technology mostly it's just an antibody. Uh, of course, there are a few things that you need to consider, but nonetheless, the basic principle is an antibody. So what is a rapid test kit or simply abbreviated as RTK? So RTK is a diagnostic kit for fast or rapid screening or detection of a disease or infection. Okay, it's a rapid way of detection. Um, if you have seen one, or if you, if you are married, then definitely you have used RTK before, especially for HIV. Um, if one day you are pregnant, and one way to actually see whether, you know, it's a rapid diagnosis, you don't have to see a doctor, you can just go to um, a pharmacy, uh, buy um, a, a rapid detection pregnancy test kit, okay? So from, from there, from, from these kits, you can actually know whether it's a disease or a symptom, or I should have, I should have not put it as disease and infection, because otherwise, you might say that babies is a disease. <laughs> okay, um, it's, it's a joke. Okay, um, so it's it's a way for identify um, an indicator for a uh, physiological change. Okay, so uh, the basic principle is a visual color test for detection of a biomarker. So if you look at that. Okay, you will see that they normally there will be a blue line. So similarly, for um, a pregnancy kit, you can see either a plus or a minus. So these lines are all the technology that I'll be talking about. Okay, the, this, the principle is similar. Uh, it might be a different in terms of the antibody that they use, 
the technology that they use might be different, the ways of producing all the components might be different, but the basic principle is similar, whereby it's a visual color test. So you can see clearly that the plus or the minus is blue in color, right? Um, and, and of course, uh, there are some that shows a red color and so on and so forth. So color is not an issue here. Okay, so what is a biomarker? A biomarker is a, just a biological marker. By definition, by Encyclopedia Britannica, it's a quantifiable biological parameter that serve as an indicator for a particular physiological state. So this definition is a way better in, in to include um, a pregnancy test kit as part of a rapid test kit, okay? Yeah. So what is an RTK and what makes it marketable? So you might heard that um, um, RTK is not really good, okay? So our uh, Dato um, Tan Sri um, Hisham uh, also mentioned that RTK for COVID-19 should not be used uh, in the current situation. Okay, so we will see what are the limitations. Um, but because there's limitation, what makes it marketable? So why people still use RTK or why is RTK can be marketed? So the first one is um, it's a screening kit. So screening means that you just go and do it like very quickly. So it's cheap and quick. Okay, cheap but quick. Uh, cheap and quick. Either or is fine. Okay, uh, quick meaning that if you do um, a QT PCR, a qualitative uh, polymerase chain reaction, uh, whereby you need to be swabbed and whatnot in a hospital, that test normally takes uh, up to twenty four hours for processing. Um, if there's more patients, then uh, maybe the processing will take two or three days, okay? But uh, an RTK is an instant result kit. That's one. Second one, why uh, is it valuable? Because it provides confidential confidentiality and it, it is anonymous. Um, you can just buy it from a market. Um, of course, we're not talking about um, COVID-19 rapid test kit because it's still um, not marketable in pharmacies and whatnot. Okay, but nonetheless, um, if you are the person who actually bought it, you use it at home, nobody knows, right? Similarly as a pregnancy test kit. So if you go to a hospital, you did your scan and then there's a baby, then obviously there will be a record. Uh, this person went to a hospital this day, um, ultrasound scan has been done and there's a baby, for example, okay? So they, they, they will be, they will definitely be a record if you go to hospital. But if you just use the pregnancy test kit, you can just do it at home, nobody will know, okay? So, um, and, and the third one, uh, it can be done routinely. So um, there are a cancer test kit, for example, so you can just do it uh, annually just to check whether they might be cancerous um, developed inside your, your body or um, routinely in terms of a rapid test kit being used for COVID-19. So, you know, something that can be done uh, multiple times in, in a year and it's not expensive. That's one criteria. Again, it goes back to the cost and then uh, it goes back to the time. It's very, very quick. Okay. Additionally, um, RTK can be an OTC product. So OTC means over the counter, where it can be sold in pharmacy. Okay. But QT PCR, for example, you definitely need to go to hospital because the machine itself is very expensive. So the limitation for RTK um, in general, this is not specific for COVID-19, in general is there is a test window. Okay. Meaning that, um, say for example, if you're just being infected, so someone uh, who has a uh, who 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 is a positive in COVID nineteen sneezes at you, okay, you definitely will get COVID nineteen. But if you go and do a rapid test kit, it might show you it might show you uh, a negative results. While if you actually do a swab test, it will give you a positive result. Okay, so that what it means by a test window, but if someone sneezes at you, you waited for uh, three to four days, and then you do your RTK, it might show you a positive. So 
um, that what it means by um, a test window. Um, additionally, the limitation is low to medium diagnosis. What do I mean by that is that the for per performance is not as good as the conventional QT PCR. Okay, QT PCR is a polymerase chain reaction. It polymerizes um, the RNA from uh, the virus. Okay, so even if you have one copy of the virus, um, the QT PCR can actually amplify it until it can be detected. Okay, so when QT PCR says uh, it's a positive, then there is almost a 90-100% uh, guarantee that you are actually a positive. Okay, but for a rapid test kit, even if it says you are a positive, what you will not need to do is you need to go to hospital um, and tell the person, I did RTK, RTK says I'm positive, so can you test me? Okay, so that's, that's the way it is. Um, so RTK is not as, um, as accurate as uh, a QT-PCR or conventional method. So what is the general principle? So I've been talking about RTK, so how does it work? How do you produce one if you want to? So this is what um, RTK is, so that is kind of like a step. Step number one, this is what happens. Step number two, this is what happens. Step number three, this is what happens. So initially you have your analyte. Okay, so this can be your sample. Uh, of course, depending on different RTKs, some RTKs uses a different um, analyte. So it can be blood, it can be saliva. Okay, so it, it might be a stool or urine in case for uh, pregnancy test kit. Okay, so there are a lot of types of analytes that can be used. So for um, the COVID-19 rapid test kit, so far they are using blood. Okay, that one of course is urine. Um, stool can be used for cancer, for example. Saliva can be in anything else. So there, there is a, a development currently ongoing in trying to use saliva as the, um, the analyte for uh, COVID-19 detection. Now, so first one, you have the analyte, so you drop the analyte into the rapid test kit, and then within the rapid test kit, there can either be uh, already embedded um, label antibodies. Again, the keywords goes back to our two lectures previous, antibodies. So that's why I keep on talking about antibodies and whatnot specificity of antibodies and so on and so forth because of this rapid test kit is using antibodies as the core technology okay so you have an a labeled antibody so it's not just uh, any antibody the antibody is labeled so it can be colored antibody so again this is a specific example there can be um, differences in terms of label antibodies can be somewhere else or the analyte can be added with a solvent containing um, the labeled antibodies okay so a variation of this, but in general principle, this is what we have. You have the analyte, so you have the sample or the analyte. You have a label antibody that will bind to um, the antibodies inside your analyte. So the analyte can be uh, other antibodies. Okay, it can be um, any antigen. Okay, so it can be. Um, well, I would say either of those two. As far as I know, it can be either of these two. So you can look at uh, the RTK, can look for um, the antigen itself, or you can look for the antibodies that is already being produced inside your body. So um, if, if you have something like this, as you can see, as the analyte passes through, okay, the analyte is the circle ones. Okay, so this one is the analyte. Okay, so as it passes through, the label antibodies so the antibodies will pick up the analyte okay uh, they pick up the analyte so again i'm just going to say it's an analyte because the analyte can be either um, an antibody or it can also be an antigen okay and then the analyte will move through the um, rtk and then you have two layers at least you will have a two, these two lines so one line is what we call as a test line. The second line is a control line. Okay. So as it passes through, and in both of these lines, there are again different antibodies. Okay. 
So the test line will have an antibody that can either bind to um, a, a specific, another region of the analyte, so uh, of the antigen. For example, um, say if this is um, your antigen, right? So the first one, the uh, this is your analyte. The first antibody binds to this particular region up here. Okay, and this particular antibody contains. Um, so this particular this particular antibody contains the label, um, the the colored thingy. Okay, um, in in the lecture it shows as a circle. So this is the antibody connecting to the the colored label, and then as it passes through the test line, another antibody might bind to this particular region. Okay, um, so what will happen is that. Now you get a line of colors under your test. Okay, so um, that's what it shows here. So you have your first antibody binds to the analyte, and then this analyte um, shows a color based on the labeled molecule, All right? And then as it passes through, so some of these um, labeled antibodies, um, some of these labeled antibodies might not bind to any analyte because the analyte is very small you might just use one drop so there is a very limited number of either antibodies or antigen inside the the, the blood or the saliva and, and so on and so forth so um, the antibodies uh, the label antibodies that was uh, created initially inside the rtk might just flow through and then finally it will create another line another row as a control line okay so once you have this, then you will get the two lines. Okay. For example, for the rapid test kit that was shown in the previous um, uh, previous two slides, okay, so this one. So there's two lines, a plus and a minus. So meaning wh while having this a minus line, what it means is actually the test line has no antibodies, no um, label antibodies binds to that particular region, so there's no line. But the color line or the the control line, it will definitely capture um, the anti antibodies that was initially uh, pre prepared inside the test kit itself. So this control line is very important because if you don't see a control line, it means that your RTK is invalid okay your test is invalid so that's why uh, a control line is, is needed for this particular purpose uh, for, for all purpose I would say for uh, all rapid test kit they will definitely have a control line okay so um, I, I remember a few uh, weeks ago whereby um, some people mentioned that um, you know they, they, they use in a, a rapid test kit there's a line and then he mentioned that um, he's positive, COVID-19 positive, but uh, uh, nobody actually goes to his house and, and bring him to hospital for, or, or quarantine center, okay? Because he only have one line, and that line is actually a control line and not a test line. So if you only see one line, normally you are normal, there's, there's no issue, there's no physiological changes, but if you do see two lines, it means that something is wrong, or there is a change in, in your body, okay? All right, and this is an example um, of a COVID-19 test kit by an SA Genie, okay? So it's, it's a technology that, that being produced in the US and it has the same principle. So it has an antibody um, from, from the analyte, so from the sample source, and then you have a conjugation pad. This is where you will have your labeled um, antibodies, okay? And then, um, you have a mix when, when your sample passes through the conjugation pad, so some of the antibodies will be, uh, will bind to this um, label antibodies. And instead of having just th two lines as shown in the previous slide, now you have a three lines. You have an M line, which is for IgM, okay, the immunoglobulin M. You have IgG, and then you have your control line, okay. So this rapid test kit is more specific because it's looking at not just IgG, but also looking at two, uh, different types of um, antibody, which is IgM. So it's more uh, accurate than having just um, 
a RTK that focusing only on two lines. Alright, so um, you know, rapid test kit in Malaysia, some says it's good, some says it's bad. Uh, there's a lot of arguments with it. So um, towards the end of the day, it's good if you know about the technology and you know if two lines, what does it mean by two lines, what does it mean by one line, and so on and so forth. So that's why it's very important to understand the uh, concept behind it and, and f um, finally you will be able to um, apply it um, in your daily life. Okay, so that's all for this lecture. Um, please um, help me by completing this uh, survey. You can just QR, the, uh, you can scan the code and the intervention for this lecture is intervention B which is um, embedded questions in spectrum. Okay, that's all. Um, this is our reference list and and everything else, thank you and um, have a good day ahead.